You wouldn't think that anyone would want to spend their lives scavenging stinking sewers as a job, but they did in Victorian times. If you've been watching my videos on the worst jobs in Victorian England, you will already know that desperate people driven by sheer poverty were forced into horrendous work. Check out the description and end screen for links. In the 1840s, the Victorian journalist Henry Mayhew observed and documented the state of working people in London. He described the lives of these sewer hunters, or toshers, as they were known, in great detail. And in this video, Mayhew guides us through the everyday dangers and difficulties they faced to make money, and also interviews a tosher who honestly discusses his hazardous work. You will learn that this was no easy life. The authorities had recently prohibited their activities and it was tough to work in secret to evade the police and suspicious eyes peering through grates from the streets above, though it was evidently financially rewarding work nevertheless. Mayhew talks of vast clumps of valuable metals to be discovered and an abundance of coins just waiting to be picked out of cracks in walls. These treasures compensating in no small part for the skills and courage the Tosha required to earn a living. In stark contrast to his fellow and unfortunate shore scavenger, the Mudlark. But to be a successful sewer hunter, a Tosher didn't only have to contend with filth of every conceivable kind, but had to battle a labyrinth of ancient collapsing tunnels, torrents of tidal water, and, not least, ferocious man-eating rats. Before we start, please consider clicking the subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. These two things really do show your support and help the channel grow so I can bring you more. Thank you. Check out the description for links to more interesting videos about the Victorians and take a look at the channel page for even more content. Were it not a notorious fact, it might perhaps be thought impossible that men could be found who, for the chance of obtaining a living of some sort or other, would day after day and year after year continue to travel through underground channels for the scouring of the city. But such is the case, even at the present moment. In former times, however, this custom prevailed much more than now. For in those days, the sewers were entirely open to flood the low-lying districts and presented no obstacle to anyone desirous of entering them. Many wondrous tales are still told among the people of men having lost their way in the sewers and of having wandered among the filthy passages, their lights extinguished by the noisome vapours, till, faint and overpowered, they dropped down and died on the spot. Other stories are told of sewer hunters beset by myriads of enormous rats and slaying thousands of them in their struggle for life, till at length the swarms of the savage things overpowered them, and in a few days afterwards, their skeletons were discovered, picked to the very bones. Since the iron doors, however, have been placed on the main sewers, a prohibition has been issued against entering them, and a reward of five pounds offered to any person giving information so as to lead to the conviction of any offender. Nevertheless, many still travel through these foul labyrinths in search of such valuables as may have found their way down the drains. The persons who are in the habit of searching the sewers call themselves shore men or shore workers. They belong, in a certain degree, to the same class as the mudlarks. That is to say, they travel through the mud along shore in the neighborhood of shipbuilding and ship breaking yards for the purpose of picking up copper nails, boats, iron, and old rope. The shoremen, however, do not collect the lumps of coal and wood they meet on their way, but leave them as the proper perquisites of the mudlarks. The sewer hunters were formerly, and indeed are still, called by the name of toshers. 
the articles which they pick up in the course of their wanderings along shore being known among themselves by the general term tosh, a word more particularly applied by them to anything made of copper. These toshers may be seen, especially on the Surrey side of the Thames, habited in long greasy velveteen coats, furnished with pockets of vast capacity, and their nether limbs encased in dirty canvas trousers, and any old slops of shoes that may be fit only for wading through the mud. They carry a bag on their back, and in their hand a pole seven or eight feet long, on one end of which there is a large iron hoe. The uses of this instrument are various. With it, they try the ground wherever it appears unsafe before venturing onto it, and, when assured of its safety, walk forward steadying their footsteps with the staff. Should they, as often happens, even to the most experienced, sink in some quagmire. They immediately throw out the long pole armed with a hoe, which is always held uppermost for this purpose, and with it seizing hold of any object within their reach, are thereby enabled to draw themselves out. Without the pole, however, their danger would be greater, for the more they struggle to extricate themselves from such places, the deeper they would sink, and even with it, they might perish. I am told, in some part, if there were nobody at hand to render them assistance. Finally, they make use of this pole to rake about the mud when searching for iron, copper, rope, and bones. They mostly exhibit great skill in discovering these things in unlikely places and have a knowledge of the various sets of the tide calculated to carry articles to particular points, almost equal to the dredgermen themselves. Although they cannot pick up as much now as they formerly did, they are still able to make what they call a fair living, and can afford to look down with a species of aristocratic contempt on the poor efforts of their less fortunate brethren, the mudlarks. To enter the sewers and explore them to any considerable distance is considered, even by those acquainted with what is termed working the shores, an adventure of no small risk. There are a variety of perils to be encountered in such places. The brickwork in many parts, especially in the old sewers, has become rotten through the continual action of the putrefying matter and moisture, and parts have fallen down and choked up the passage with heaps of rubbish. Over these obstructions, nevertheless, the sewer hunters have to scramble in the best way they can, in such parts they are careful not to touch the brickwork overhead, for the slightest tap might bring down an avalanche of old bricks and earth, and severely injure them, if not bury them in the rubbish. Since the construction of the new sewers, the old ones are in general abandoned by the hunters, but in many places the former channels cross and recross those recently constructed and in the old sewers a person is very likely to lose his way. It is dangerous to venture far into any of the smaller sewers branching off from the main, for in this the hunters have to stoop low down in order to proceed, and from the confined space there are often accumulated in such places large quantities of foul air which, as one of them stated, will cause instantaneous death. Moreover, far from there being any romance in the tales told of the rats, these vermin are really numerous and formidable in the sewers, and have been known, I am assured, to attack men when alone, and even sometimes when accompanied by others, with such fury that the people have escaped from them with difficulty. They are particularly ferocious and dangerous, if they be driven into some corner whence they cannot escape when they will immediately fly at anyone that opposes their progress. I received a similar account to this from one of the London flusher men. Moreover, in some quarters, ditches or trenches are filled as the water rushes up the sewers with a tide. In these ditches, the water is retained by a sluice, which is shut down at high tide, and lifted again at low tide. 
When it rushes down the sewers with all the violence of a mountain torrent sweeping everything before it, if the sewer hunter be not close to some branch sewer so that he can run into it whenever the opening of these sluices takes place, he must inevitably perish. The trenches of water reservoirs for the cleaning of the sewers are chiefly on the south side of the river and, as a proof of the great danger to which the sewer hunters are exposed in such cases, it may be stated that not very long ago, a sewer on the south side of the Thames was opened to be repaired. A long ladder reached to the bottom of the sewer, down which the bricklayer's laborer was going with a hod of bricks. When the rush of water from the sluice struck the bottom of the ladder and instantly swept away ladder, laborer, and all, the bricklayer fortunately was enjoying his pint and pipe at a neighboring public house. The laborer was found by my informant, a shore worker near the mouth of the sewer, quite dead, battered, and disfigured in a frightful manner. There was likewise great danger in former times from the rising of the tide in the sewers, so that it was necessary for the shoremen to have quitted them before the water had got any height within the entrance. At present, however, this is obviated in those sewers, where the main is furnished with an iron door towards the river. The shore workers, when about to enter the sewers, provide themselves in addition to the long hoe already described, with a canvas apron, which they tie round them, and a dark lantern similar to a policeman's. This they strap before them on their right breast, in such a manner that on removing the shade, the bull's eye throws the light straight forward when they are in an erect position, and enables them to see everything in advance of them for some distance. But when they stoop, it throws the light directly under them, so that they can then distinctly see any object at their feet. The sewer hunters usually go in gangs of three or four for the sake of company and in order that they may be better able to defend themselves from the rats. The old hands who have been often up, and every gang endeavors to include at least one experienced person, travel a long distance, not only through the main sewers, but also through many of the branches. Whenever the shoremen come near a street grating, they close their lanterns and watch their opportunity of gliding silently past, unobserved, for otherwise a crowd might collect overhead and intimate to the policeman on duty that there were persons wandering in the sewers below. The sewer workers never take dogs with them, lest their barking when hunting the rats might excite attention. As the men go along, they search the bottom of the sewer, raking away the mud with their hoe, and pick, from between the crevices of the brickwork, money, or anything else that may have lodged there. There are many parts of the sewer's holes where the brickwork has been worn away, and in these holes clusters of articles are found, which have been washed into them from time to time, and perhaps been collecting there for years such as pieces of iron, nails, various scraps of metal, coins of every description, all rusted into a mass, like a rock, and weighing from a half hundred to two hundred weight altogether. These conglomerates of metal are too heavy for the men to take out of the sewers, so that, if unable to break them up, they are compelled to leave them behind. And there are very many such masses. I am informed, lying in the sewers at this moment, of immense weight and growing larger every day by continual additions. The shoremen find great quantities of money, of copper money especially. Sometimes they dive their arm down to the elbow in the mud and filth and bring up shillings, sixpences, half crowns and occasionally half sovereigns and sovereigns. They always find the coin standing edge uppermost between the bricks in the bottom where the mortar has been worn away. The sewer hunters occasionally find plate such as spoons, ladles, silver-handled knives and forks, mugs and drinking cups, and now and then articles of jewelry. But even while thus in luck, as they call it, they do not omit to fill the bags on their backs with the more cumbrous articles they meet with, 
such as metals of every description, rope and bones. There is always a great quantity of these things to be met with in the sewers, they being continually washed down from the cesspools and drains of the houses. When the sewer hunters consider they have searched long enough, or when they have found as much as they can conveniently take away, the gang leave the sewers and, adjourning to the nearest of their homes, count out the money they have picked up and proceed to dispose of the old metal, bones, ropes, etc. This done, they then, as they term it, whack the whole lot. That is, they divide it equally among all hands. At these divisions, I am assured, it frequently occurs that each member of the gang will realize from thirty shillings to two pounds. This at least was a frequent occurrence some few years ago. Of late, however, the shoremen are obliged to use far more caution, as the police, and especially those connected with the river, who are more on the alert, as well as many of the coal merchants in the neighborhood of the sewers, would give information if they saw any suspicious persons approaching them. The principal localities in which the shore hunters reside are in Mint Square, Mint Street, and Kent Street. In the borough, Snowfields, Bermondsey, and that never-failing locality between the London Docks and Rosemary Lane, which appears to be a concentration of all the misery of the kingdom. There were known to be, a few years ago, nearly 200 sewer hunters, or toshers, and, incredible as it may appear, I have satisfied myself that, taking one week with another, they could not be said to make much short of two pounds per week. Their probable gains, I was told, were about six shillings per day all year round. At this rate, the property recovered from the sewers of London would have amounted to no less than twenty thousand pounds per annum which would make the amount of property lost down the drains of each house amount to one shilling four pence a year. The shore hunters of the present day greatly complain of the recent restrictions, and inveigh in no measured terms against the constituted authorities. They won't let us in to work the shores, say they, cause there's a little danger. They fears as how we'll get suffocated, at least they tells us so, but they don't care if we get starved. No, there doesn't mind nothing about that. It is, however, more than suspected that these men find plenty of means to evade the vigilance of the sewer officials and continue quietly to reap a considerable harvest, gathered whence it might otherwise have rotted in obscurity. The sewer hunters, strange as it may appear, are certainly smart fellows and take decided precedence of all the other finders of London whether by land or water, both on account of the greater amount of their earnings and the skill and courage they manifest in the pursuit of their dangerous employment. But like all who make a living, as it were, by a game of chance, plodding, carefulness, and saving habits cannot be reckoned among their virtues. They are improvident, even to a proverb, with their gains superior even to those of the better paid artisans and far beyond the amount received by many clerks who have to maintain a respectable appearance. The shoremen might, with but ordinary prudence, live well, have comfortable homes, and even be able to save sufficient to provide for themselves in their old age. Their practice, however, is directly the reverse. They no sooner make a hall, as they say, then they adjourn to some low public house in the neighborhood, and seldom leave till empty pockets and hungry stomachs drive them forth to procure the means for a fresh debauch. It is principally on this account that, despite their large gains, they are to be found located in the most wretched quarter of the metropolis. It might be supposed that the sewer hunters, passing much of their time in the midst of the noisome vapors generated by the sewers, the odors of which escaping upwards from the gratings in the streets, is dreaded and shunned by all as something pestilential, would exhibit in their pallid faces the unmistakable evidence of their unhealthy employment. But this is far from the fact. Strange to say, the sewer hunters are strong, robust, and healthy men generally florid in their complexion, 
while many of them know illness only by name. Some of the elder men who head the gangs when exploring the sewers are between 60 and 80 years of age and have followed the employment during their whole lives. The men appear to have a fixed belief that the odor of the sewers contributes in a variety of ways to their general health. Nevertheless, they admit that accidents occasionally occur from the air in some places, being fully impregnated with mephitic gas. I found one of these men, from whom I derived much information, and who is really an active intelligent man, in a court off Rosemary Lane. Access is gained to this court through a dark, narrow entrance, scarcely wider than a doorway, running beneath the first floor of one of the houses in the adjoining street. The court itself is about 50 yards long, and not more than three yards wide, surrounded by lofty wooden houses with jutting abutments in many of the upper stories that almost exclude the light and give them the appearance of being about to tumble down upon the heads of the intruders. This court is densely inhabited. Every room has its own family, more or less in number, and in many of them, I am assured, there are two families residing, the better to enable the one to whom the room is let to pay the rent. At the time of my visit, which was in the evening, after the inmates had returned from their various employments, some quarrel had arisen among them. The court was so thronged with the friends of the contending individuals and spectators of the fight that I was obliged to stand at the entrance, unable to force my way through the dense multitude, while laborers and street folk with shaggy heads and women with dirty caps and fuzzy hair thronged every window above and peered down anxiously at the affray. There must have been some hundreds of people collected there. And yet all were inhabitants of this very court, for the noise of the quarrel had not yet reached the street. On wondering at the number, my informant, when the noise had ceased, explained the matter as follows. You see, sir, there's more than thirty houses in this here court, and there's not less than eight rooms in every house. Now, there's nine or ten people in some of the rooms, I knows, but just say four in every room, and calculate what that comes to. I did, and I found it, to my surprise, to be 960. Well, continued my informant, chuckling and rubbing his hands in evident delight at the result, you may as well just tack a couple of hundred on the tail of them for make weight, as we're not very particular about a hundred or two, one way or the other, in these here places. In this court, up three flights of narrow stairs that creaked and trembled at every footstep, and in an ill-furnished garret dwelt the shore worker, a man who, had he been careful, according to his own account at least, might have money in the bank and be the proprietor of the house in which he lived. The sewer hunters, like the street people, are all known by some peculiar nickname, derived chiefly from some personal characteristic. It would be a waste of time to inquire for them by their right names, even if you were acquainted with them, for none else would know them, and no intelligence concerning them could be obtained. While under the title of Lanky Bill, Long Tom, One-Eyed George, Short-Armed Jack, they are known to everyone. My informant, who is also dignified with a title, or as he calls it, a handle to his name, gave me the following account of himself. I was born in Birmingham, but afore I recollects anything, we came to London. The first thing I remembers is being down on the shore at the Cuckold's Point, when the tide was out and up to my knees in mud, and a-getting down deeper and deeper every minute till I was picked up by one of the shore workers. I used to get down there every day to look at the ships and boats a-sailing up and down. I'd never be tired of looking at them at the time. At last, Father prenticed me to the blacksmith in Bermondsey, and then I couldn't get down to the river when I liked, so I got to hate the forge and the fire, and blowing the bellows, and couldn't stand the confinement, no how. At last, I cuts and runs. After some time, they gets me back again, but I cuts again. I was determined not to stand it. I wouldn't go home for fear I'd be sent back, so I goes down to the Cuckold's Point, 
and there I sits near half the day, when who should I see but the old un as had picked me up out of the mud when I was a sinking. I tells him all about it, and he takes me home along with himself, and gets me a bag and an o, and takes me out next day, and shows me what to do, and shows me the dangerous places and the places what are safe, and how to rake in the mud for rope and bones and iron, and that's the way I come to be a shore worker. Lord bless you, I've worked Cuckold's Point for more nor twenty year. I know places where you'd go over head and ears in the mud, and just alongside on em, you may walk as safe as you can on this floor. But it don't do for a stranger to try it. He'd very soon get in, and it's not so easy to get out again. I can tell you, I stayed with the old one a long time, and we used to get lots of tin, especially when we'd go to work the sewers. I liked that well enough. I could get into small places where the old one couldn't, and when I'd got near the grating in the street, I'd search about in the bottom of the sewer. I put down the arm to me shoulder in the mud and bring up shillings and half crowns and lots of coppers and plenty of other things. I once found a silver jug as big as a quart pot <laughs> and often found spoons and knives and forks and everything you can think of. Bless your heart, the smell's nothing. It's a roguish smell at first, but nothing near so bad as you thinks. Cause, you see, there's a sitch lots of water always a coming down the sewer, and the air gets in from the gratings, and that helps to sweeten it a bit. There's some places, especially in the old sewers, where they say there's foul air, and they tell me the foul air ill cause instantaneous death. But I never met with anything of the kind, and I think if there was such a thing, I should know something about it for I've worked the sewers on and off for twenty year. And when we comes to a narrow place, as we don't know, we takes the candle out of the lantern and fastens it uh, on the end of the O, and then runs it up the sewer, and if the light stays in, we knows as there ain't no danger. We used to go up to the city sewer at Blackfriars Bridge, but that's stopped up now. It's boarded across inside. The city wouldn't let us up if they knew it, cause of the danger, they say, but they don't care if we haven't got nothing to eat nor a place to put our heads in. While well, there's plenty of money lying there and good for nobody. If you was caught up and brought afore the Lord Mayor, he'd give you fourteen days on it, as safe as the bellows, so a good many of us now is afraid to venture in. We don't venture as we used to, but still it's done at times. There's many places, as I knows, as where the bricks has fallen down. <laughs> and that there's dangerous. It's so dilapidated that if you touches it with your head or with the end of the O, it'll all come down the top of you. I've often seen as many as an hundred rats at once, and they're whoppers in the sewers, I can tell you. Then their water rats, too, is far more ferocious than any other rats, and they'd think nothing of tackling a man if they found they couldn't get away no how. But if they can, why, they runs by and gets out of the road. I know the chap as the rats tackled in the sewers. They bit him awfully. You must have heard on it. It was him as the watermen went in after, when they heard him a-shouting as they was a-rowing by. Only for the watermen. The rats would have done for him. Safe enough. Do you recollect hearing on the man as was found in the sewers about twelve year ago? Ah, you must. The rats eat every bit of them, and left nothing but his bones. I knowed him well. He was a regular shore worker. The rats is very dangerous, that's certain, but we always goes three or four on us together, and the varmint's too wide awake to tackle us then, for they know they'd get off second pest. You can go a long way in the sewers if you like. I don't know how far. I never was at the end of them myself, for a cove can't stop in longer than six or seven hour, cause of the tide. You must be out before that's up. There's a many branches on every side, but we don't go into it all. We go where we know, uh, and where we're always sure to find something. I know a place now where there's more than two or three hundred weight of metal all rusted together, and plenty of money among it too, but it's too heavy to carry out, so it'll stop there, I suppose, till the world comes to an end. I often bought out a piece of metal half a hundred weight in weight, and took it onto the arch of the bridge, and broke it up with a large stone to pick out the money. I found sovereigns and half sovereigns over and over again, and three on us have often cleared a couple of pound apiece in one day out of the sewers. But we no sooner got the money than the public and had it, 
<laughs> I often wish I'd back all the money I'd given to the publican, and I wouldn't care how the wind blew for the rest of my life. I never thought about taking an hammer along with me into the sewer. No, I never thought I'd want it. You can't go in every day. The tides don't answer, but they're so particular now. Far more particular than formerly. If you was known to touch the traps, you'd get hauled up before the beak. It's done for all that, and though there is so many eyes about, the Johnnies on the water are always on the lookout. And if they sees any of us about, we has to cut our lucky. We shore workers sometimes does very well other ways. When we hears of a fire anywheres, we goes and watches where they shoots the rubbish. Then we goes and sifts it over and washes it afterwards. Then all the metal sinks to the bottom. The way we does it is this here. We takes a barrel, cutting off, and fills it with water. And then we shovels in the siftings and stirs them round and round and round with a stick. Then we throws out the water and puts in some fresh and stirs that there round again. After some time, the water gets clear, and everything heavy's fell to the bottom. Then we sees what it is, and picks it out. I've made from a pound to thirty shilling a day. I've that there work on lead alone. The time the uh, Parliament Houses was burnt, the rubbish was shot in Hyde Park, and Long J and I goes to work it. And while we were at it, we didn't make less nor three pounds a piece a day. We found sovereigns and half sovereigns, and lots of silver half melted away, and jewellery, such as rings and stones and brooches. But we never got half paid for them. I found two sets of bracelets for a lady's arms, and tucks them to a jeweller, and he tried them just where the great heat had melted the catch away and found there was only metal double-plated, or else he said as how he'd give us thirty pounds for them. However, we takes them down to a Jew in Petticoat Lane, who used to buy things of us, and he gives us seven pounds ten shillings for them. When we found so many things that at last Long Jay and I got to a, <laughs> we got to a quarrel about the whacking. There was cheating a going on. It wasn't all fair and above board as it ought to be, so we gets to fighting and kicks up such a jolly row that they wouldn't let us work no more and takes and buries the old lot of the rubbish. Oh, there's plenty of things under the ground along with it now, if anybody could get at them. There was just two loads of rubbish shot at one time in Bishop Bonner's fields, which I worked by myself, and what do you think I made out of that there? Why, I made three pounds five shillings. The rubbish was got out of a cellar, what hadn't been stirred for fifty year or more. So, I thinks there ought to be something in it, and it keeps my eye on it, and watches where it's shot. Then I turns to work, and the first thing I gets hold on is a chain, which I takes to be copper. It was so dirty, but it turned out to be all solid gold, and I gets one pound five shillings for it from the Jew. After that I finds lots of coppers and silver money and many things besides. The reason I likes this sort of life is cause I can sit down when I likes and nobody can order me about when I'm hard up. I knows as how I must work and then I goes at it like sticks are breaking. And though the times isn't as they was, I can go now and pick up my four or five bob a day where another wouldn't know how to get a brass farthing.